Hi everyone, Stepan here. Today I'm going to continue the series on the Nimso Indian with the main line, the move e3 on move 4 for white. If you haven't seen the introductory video on the Nimso, please do. Uh, there I have explained the basics and the main opening ideas for both sides. Okay, let's get into the main line of the Nimso. d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, and we have the Nimso Indian defense with bishop b4. Now white has ha here has several options. He could play queen c2, knight f3, f3, g3, uh, bishop g5. There are several options. We are going to cover them in separate videos. But we are going to start with the main line, the move e3. Now, in all other variations uh, of the Nimso Indian, White is accepting the fact that black is going to have a lead in development. For example, if we look at the queen c2 Nimso Indian, the classical variation, after queen c2 and let's say castles a3, bishop takes c3, queen takes c3, you can see that black has already castled, he already has a knight on f6, whereas white has only developed his queen, moved it twice, and it's now on c3. Along with that, he has made three pawn moves. So the classical Nimso Indian is quite different to the main line, as we are going to see. After bishop b4, uh, white chooses to play the main line, the move e3, because he simply wants to keep up in development. As you can see, black is just about to castle. And black is going to castle next move, most likely. And if white doesn't play classically, if he doesn't follow the classical principles, he is going to fall behind the development and in theory uh, be in more danger than black because his king will be less safe and he's going to have less pieces developed. On the other hand, in uh, the main line, in e3, there are downsides for whites which we are going to discuss. Firstly, because the queen is not on c2 now, uh, black always has the option of doubling white's pawns on c3, which isn't a good idea, I'm just pointing that out. So black could have equal development with white at a cost for white of a structural deficit, uh, the doubled pawns on the c-file. Furthermore, uh, black is able now, uh, because white has played the slow move uh, e3, he is able to contest the center much easier. And as we are going to see, these games are often going to end up in a different kind of a structural advantage for black, and that's going to be white having an isolated queen spawn. So isolated queen spawn positions, uh, which the e3 Nimzo Indian, or the normal line, or the main line of the Nimzo Indian often results in, are very aggressive positions in which white has to compensate for the structural weakness, with dynamic play and white wants to keep the pieces on the board white will often have attacking plans against h7 against e6 and will generally be putting pressure on the black king not wanting to trade pieces on the other hand black is going to want to trade the pieces off because any trades benefit him because the end game is better for him since white has an isolated pawn we're going to be looking at uh, three options for black here uh, on move four we are going to look at castles which is the main move uh, we are also going to be looking at the move c5, the Hubner variation, and we are going to be looking at the move b6, the St. Petersburg variation. I want to show all three to show the flexibility of the defense for black. Uh, pretty much whatever, whichever variation white chooses, black will have a few options. Against the main line, that is no different. Uh, the move b6, which we are going to look at first, is the slowest one. I would say uh, contesting the center a few moves later, preparing to either Fianchetto has bishop or to place it on a6, more commonly it will go on a6, pinning this pawn because if the pawn moves, uh, the white king is going to be forced to recapture on f1, thus forfeiting castling rights. Now, as in most variations of the e3 Nimzo, black, uh, white can choose between two moves uh, now. Uh, the two main moves in every variation black would go for are either bishop d3 or knight e2. The difference is that after knight e2, uh, the knight reinforces the c3 square. So if the bishop ever captures on c3, the knight is able to recapture. And the difference is with the bishop on d3, uh, since the bishop is developing first, black will always have the option of uh, capturing on on c3 if he wishes to do so, and the knight is more commonly going to go to f3 and not to e2, because this diagonal can be weak. So if the, the bishop develops first, then black can use the fact that this diagonal has been weakened, forcing the knight to f3 and removing the potential defender of the c3 square. So let's look at bishop d3 first. That is a sideline, knight e2 is more common. 
as I said, the first move makes sense. Fianchettoing his bishop with a tempo, but white makes uh, a useful developing move as well. Knight f3, both sides now castle. And here, uh, black can choose to play aggressively in two different ways. He can either uh, try to force open the center with the move c5 or with the move d5. Uh, c5 is slightly more common. Uh, after c5, uh, white now has to do something. Uh, the main move here is knight a4, trying to prevent uh, the bishop from capturing here and also putting pressure on the c5 square, preparing to play the move a3, because in many positions now uh, the bishop is trapped, so if black does something stupid like h6, the move a3 actually traps the bishop because it no longer has a target here. So after the move knight a4, black has to do something. a3 is coming. Uh, and his bishop is trapped, so the only move here is c takes d4, opening up the diagonal so that the bishop can retreat. e takes d4, rook e8. After rook e8 here, uh, black is fine, black's development uh, is equal, white still has to develop his uh, dark squared bishop, black is still uh, about to develop his knight. He has a great bishop on b7, he has a sort of awkward bishop on c5, and the position is fine. White has these pawns which cannot be contested easily. Black will look forward to moves such as d5 in the future, but that will have to be prepared. Uh, a3 is the main move here. The bishop retreats all the way back to f8. It doesn't want to disrupt the knight or block uh, the pawn from moving with d6 and c5 is just losing. b4, white expands on the queen side and now black doesn't go for the move d5 which would block up his bishop. He plays d6, a very flexible move, and now this is a sort of Sicilian defense position in which black doesn't have the c5 pawn. He's going to develop his knight to d7 and try to play slowly, play a Hedgecock-like position against white, but with the difference that white's pawns are, are advanced in the center. So if you, uh, and on the queen side, if you have experience in the Sicilian defense, it's going to be helpful here because the position is quite similar. And after castles, castles, black doesn't have to go for this risky line with c5, which I find risky because you need to retreat the bishop and all that. Black can continue with d5. And after d5, the bishop now has its natural diagonal still open. Knight a4 is not a threat, therefore is not played. So cd5 by white, ed5, a3 chasing the bishop away, and now the bishop is actually fine on d6. And this is why I like... Uh, this variation much more. Now there is a move white has to play here, if he doesn't play it black is going to be better after the move c5, so if c5 happens there's basically no good option uh, for, for white, so he has to play b4. After b4, b5 is somewhat of a threat, so a6 stopping that, queen b3 uh, putting extra pressure on the d5 pawn, queen e7 uh, developing the queen, and this is a more comfortable position than than after uh, than after d5 than after c5. I think that the bishop on d6 is much more useful than the bishop on f8, and I would just rather play this position than the previous one. Okay, uh, now let's look at after b6 the move knight e2 for white. So white can either choose to play bishop d3, and black can then choose to play c5 or d5, or white can choose to play the move knight e2, and this line is more straightforward. Here, uh, black is going to develop his bishop to a6, putting pressure on the weakness uh, on c4 immediately. a3, counterattacking, not uh, hanging the pawn, because the bishop is attacked. And now bishop takes c3. Because the knight is on e2, he can now take the bishop, thus not doubling his pawns, and also the bishop on f1 is defending the c4 square. And I find this variation rather pleasant for white. Uh, black, in my opinion, has to struggle to uh, to keep up and to equalize. This is the Bronstein variation uh, of the of the mainline Nimtsu Indian, which occurs after this exchange on, on c3. And now black has to play energetically, d5, trying to break open the center, b3, simply solidifying his pawn, so if black ever takes, uh, white is going to recapture with the pawn. Castles, bishop e2, preparing to castle, knight c6, developing his knight. The move c5 can be played, but I don't think it's as good. Uh, knight c6 is better, simply developing a piece. a4, gaining space on the queen side again, and now dc4. 
bc4 always take with the b pawn and knight a5 and the one thing i like about this position for black is that he has this annoying pressure on the c4 square and he has a very good square on a5 uh, this uh, this knight on a5 now sometimes threatens knight b3 it can also capture on c4 and it's not uh, easy to to play the only move to save the position here is either bishop a3 attacking the rook uh, thus gaining a tempo or knight uh, b5 and after c6 the knight is going to go to a3 defending the c4 square so now you can see that Although both knights have uh, have been misplaced, I would argue that Black's knight is better. Firstly, it's one square up, further up the board. Secondly, it has a target. The knight on a3 is serving a purely defensive purpose. And thirdly, if the queen ever moves, such as uh, queen d2, which is normal developing move, an exchange is hanging. So this line with e3, b6, knight e2, although I like it more for white, after bishop a6, a3, bishop c3, knight c3, d5, b3, I like this plan with after a4, knight a5, and I think black is uh, solid there. So if you choose to play b6 uh, and white plays the move knight e2, remember this positioning of the knight on a5. Okay, now let's look at the Hubner variation. On move 4, black doesn't have to play b6, uh, going for that queen side. Uh, uh, Queen's Indian defense setup with b6, bishop a6, he can play c5 instead, trying to break open the center immediately. Once again, black has white has the two same options, either bishop d3 or knight to e2. Here, bishop d3 is the main move. We are going to look at knight e2 first, which is a sideline defending c3, but now black uses the chance to open up the center, cd4, ed4, and d5. Now, there are two options here. Uh, white can either play the move a3, forcing the bishop away, or he can close the position down with c5. This is a move which I really struggle with uh, as black here. And I really don't like the position for black after c5. Let's look at a3 first. It's more commonly played bishop e7, knight f4. Here black can either castle or, or play dc4. I prefer the move dc4. After castles, you are allowing cd5. And after knight d5, cd5, ed5, you both have an isolated central pawn. That's why I don't like the move castles. I much prefer the move dc4. And now white is playing with an isolated queen's pawn. And you have a long-term structural advantage. Bishop c4, castles, castles, knight c6, putting pressure on the isolated pawn immediately. Bishop e3, defending. Bishop d6, knight h5. And you can see White's strategy here. He has an isolated queen's pawn, therefore he has to play energetically. If he doesn't, black is just going to convert into uh, a better endgame. So as you can see, uh, knight h5, queen h5, the bishop on, on e3, the bishop on c4 are all staring at very dangerous uh, squares in black's position. And if black isn't careful, this could be over much sooner uh, and this could be over before the endgame begins. So even though I find this more comfortable for black than the move c5, uh, a3 uh, is still pretty tricky to meet because white is going to have a lot of attacking power and you are sort of hoping to get into the endgame. Okay, after e4, d5, as I said, uh, a3 is one move, c5 is the other move. And this, here I prefer white. I really do prefer white. Uh, knight e4 is the main move putting pressure on the on the c3 knight the the advantage of this pawn advance is that white now has to play bishop d2 and black gets the bishop pair temporarily queen takes d2 a5 he's going to give it back after a3 of course but after knight takes c3 uh, a4 white has a queenside pawn majority a4 has to be played to stop b4 or b3 b4 uh, to make it much harder for the pawns uh, to advance. Now, of course, if uh, white plays b4 now, it's just ampassan, so it doesn't work. So a4 is a very necessary move to stop this majority from queening, basically. And as black, you still have to castle. You had to waste a move on a4. I don't like this position. Bishop d3. b6 challenging uh, the pawn. Uh, white's best move is to take. Queen takes b6. Bishop c2. Uh, this pawn cannot be taken because bishop check wins the queen. So something like bishop d7 and uh, developing and trying to castle. Now, the pawn on a4 is really useful in stopping the majority. 
But if black uh, ever has to face something like rook b1 and b3, a b3, rook b3, uh, white is going to have a passed pawn on a3, which can march up the board really quickly. In compensation for that, black has the fact that white has an isolated d4 pawn, which is weak in this position because the structure is very solid and there's no real attacking chances without the bishop pair. But still, I would rather be white here. So players with black, you who play the Nimtso Indian after e3, if you choose to play the move c5, the Hubner variation, watch out for knight e2. Uh, after cd4, ed4, d5, if white plays the move c5, you have to be very careful because of the pawn majority. Now, the second move is bishop d3. And this is more straightforward. Black simply develops. Knight f3, uh, taking on, on c5 is not a good uh, move for, uh, for white. Bishop takes c3. B takes c3, now doubling the pawns. And here we have one of the most thematic uh, plans for black uh, in the Nimtso Indian. Against this main line, uh, white, of course, has the bishop pair because you have chosen to double the pawns on the c file. What you are going to do now is play against the bishops. How do you play against the bishops? The bishops love an open position, so close the position down. d6. Defending the pawn, if white ever takes, this is just horrendous something like knight a5 b6 bishop a6 and the c4 pawn is falling so after d6 white is never going to take white just castles and now the second part of your plan e5 uh, once again uh, white cannot take if he takes then it's horrendous you have a sort of moroxy bind in this position playing against the bishops uh, if e4 happens the light squared bishop is dead if it doesn't happen the dark squared bishop is dead and b6, bishop a6, knight a5, and black is strategically winning here. So after e5, white has to be extremely careful here, and I enjoy, the, I enjoy this position for black uh, very much. So if you're playing the white side of this, after e3, c5, I would recommend that you avoid the move uh, bishop d3. I just love knight e2 and... Uh, and c5, the position we just looked at. But after bishop d3, knight c6, knight f3, knight t bishop takes, b takes, d6, castles, e5, I prefer black. White now needs to be smart, uh, and he plays knight d2, rerouting his pieces, uh, stopping the move e5, uh, e4, I'm sorry, black castles, rook b1, putting pressure uh, on, on the b7 pawn, uh, so b6, black wants to play b6 anyway, Knight a5, bishop a6 is always a plan here. h3, stopping bishop g4 and knight g4. Bishop d7, developing his last minor piece. And now d5. Now d5 is the best move. Uh, it doesn't have to be played, though. f4 can be played. And I would recommend this for white. If you are struggling in this position, play f4. Try to open it up. Make some squares for your bishops. If you don't, you are just going to be worse. d5 closes the position down. Uh, prepares the move f4 now, uh, but I think it's just easier to play for black. Queen c2, and now black can simply play the move such as knight g6, uh, defending everything. You are playing against long range, range pieces which only have one diagonal, whereas your knights are really, uh, are really good uh, in the attack. Your knights have a lot of scope, and they can choose to do a lot of different stuff. Okay. And now let's go to the main move. After the move e3, black's main move is to simply castle. After castles, white has the same two options once again, either bishop d3 or knight e2. Let's look at knight e2 first. This is the Reshevsky variation named after the American Samuel Reshevsky. d5, uh, black breaks open the center immediately. a3 chasing the bishop away. And since knight e2 has been played and not bishop d3, uh, black now, of course, doesn't want to take, so bishop e7, and now we have cd5, ed5, knight f4, putting pressure on the pawn, and c6. And this is simple to play. This Reshevsky variation is fairly simple to play for black. I like it. Uh, you have both of your bishops opened. You're going to play uh, something like bishop d6, perhaps. You're going to play knight uh, uh, b to d7. To f8 and to g6, your rook goes to e8. It's a very natural position to play, and even if you didn't know any theory here, you would still know what to do. One thing that has to be pointed out is that in this uh, Reshevsky variation, white has the option of playing rook b1 
and going for the minority attack. That's always a possibility. You have to watch out for that. But as I said, in the in the main line of the Rashevsky variation, it's there are going to be no problems uh, for black. So after castles, I would recommend that white plays the move bishop d3. This is the bishop attack leading to the Gligorich system uh, for black, which is the best defense to this. After the move bishop d3, you don't really want to take on c3. There's no need for that. You have two moves here, either d5 or c5 that they transpose. So we are going to look at c5, which I think is a more aggressive way to start this. Knight f3 developing. And now d5. This is now the Gligorich system. This tension in the center with d5, c5, d4, c4 is called Gligorich system. And it's the most and the best, the most aggressive and the best way to fight uh, the main line of the e3 Nimzo. After the move d5, uh, white doesn't want to resolve the tension in any way. There's no need for that. He still has to castle, so castles. And now black has two options. Uh, once again, I prefer one uh, rather than the other. Let's look at the first one. Uh, this one I, I don't like. Knight c6. After knight c6, uh, reinforcing the center, uh, threatening uh, the d5 square, uh, white now plays the move a3. And the bishop, as you can see, doesn't have an escape square. Well, it could go to a5, but that would be absurd. Uh, we have bishop takes c3, b takes c3, doubling the pawns, and queen c7. And now after queen c7, uh, black is going to play uh, against the doubled pawns. So obviously uh, he would like them to stay that way, <clears throat> but the nature of the position doesn't allow it. There are just too many pawns that can grab each other, exchange each other in the center for white to still be left with, uh, with doubled pawns after that. So this strategy, in my opinion, giving up the bishop pair, uh, giving up the dark squared bishop on c3 for no apparent attack and for no structural advantage just makes no sense in theory. It's good uh, the, uh, It's good for black according to theory. This is called the Bronstein defense and people play it, obviously uh, Bronstein played it. So it's fine, but I would recommend that you play a different move because here after cd5, ed5, something like a4 and rook e8, I don't see what black does. Black is going to have an isolated pawn if white wishes to induce that. Uh, he's stopping e4. He probably shouldn't play c4. I find it really hard to play. I find it really unpleasant. So after c5, knight f3, d5, castles, I would recommend the immediate d takes c4. Undoubling, uh, not undoubling, I'm sorry, taking the c4 pawn, taking away from the center, because now after bishop takes c4, you play the move knight bd7, reinforcing c5, and all of your pieces are now uh, on very good squares. You also have the option of taking on d4. And after queen e2, which is the best move, you play the move b6. And I find this setup remarkable for black. This is definitely my choice to, to fight uh, in the main line. So after e3 castles, if you play the main move, uh, bishop d3 is going to be played almost always. Uh, remember that after bishop d3, you have to play d5. Uh, and after we have, I'm sorry, you have to play either c5 or, or d5, but they, transpo they transpose knight f3, d5, uh, castles, play the move dc4. After dc4, bishop c4, knight bd7, queen e2, b6, you are looking forward to a fianchettoed bishop, a reinforced c5 square. You are still going to have to give away your, your bishop on c3, which is obvious, but your position is fine. Rook d1 cd4, ed4, bishop b7, and white can now try d5, which is the most energetic move. White once again has the isolated queen's pawn, and sometimes you are going to want to use it as an attacking uh, piece, as, as a, a very strong pawn controlling central squares, which is going to help in the attack. But more often, if you can dissolve it, if you can liquidate it, get rid of it, you do that. So here d5 makes sense. And d5 actually uh, liquidates the pawn immediately. Now, this is the main line of the Gligorich system, which I advise you learn uh, if you're going to play the Nimzo Indian. This is going to occur very often. And now you first weaken the d5 uh, pawn by removing one defender, bishop c3. And white doesn't have to take the bishop immediately. He takes d takes e6. And now uh, you could take here immediately but it's not as good as first 
giving up your bishop and forcing white to take with the g pawn. The queen has to stay on e2, and white wants this pressure here. Soon after, f takes e6, taking the pawn. Uh, you don't, uh, after g takes f3, you don't have time to, to save your bishop because your knight is hanging. Uh, you play f takes e6, and now white can either take here immediately on take, or take on c3 first. Taking on c3 is better. Queen c7, bishop e6, king h8. This is the starting position. You can see that black has given up a pawn. Black has four pawns, uh, white has five, but white has four pawn islands, four isolated pawns, and a set of doubled pawns. Black has to be slightly better here according to human play and even according to the engines uh, the position is even like almost not at all better for white but the thing is the engines can play with these isolated pawns for humans especially on our level it's really hard to defend all of this white has the bishop pair black has the two knights black has some wonderful squares which he can use and then come into come into white's position the white king is open because of the pawn on on f3 and it's really hard to play for white so i would love to get this position on the board and i would love uh to face white uh, here so remember that after e3 which is the main line castles bishop d3 you play either d5 or c5 that they transpose if you play d5 knight f3 we have c5 if you play c5 knight f3 we have d5 castles and now remember to play dc4 bishop c4 knight bd7 and this setup with b6 okay i'm sorry if this was a lot of theory i'm aware that it was uh but this is the main line you have to know all three options for black if you play this with white and if you play the nimtso you have to be aware of what you can play uh, i hope you like the video uh, let me know what you think. Uh, if you would like to support the channel, there is a link in the description below. Any support is greatly appreciated. And uh, stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.